conceptual people talk about it all of the elements hello everybody dr rick wallace here dropping in on you look uh the interview that you're about to see was requested by a young gentleman who is trying to get his online podcast started and he reached out to me because he had followed me for a while and he had seen me talk about the war on black love and he asked me what I speak. Those of you who know what's going on in my life right now know uh, <laughs> that black love is somewhat of a sensitive subject, not a sore subject. Uh, it's not sore because I'm not bitter, I'm not angry, uh, I'm not vengeful or vindictive. Um, I, but at the same time, I'm grieving. Uh, I'm going through a grieving process. I'm grieving a bunch of different things uh, that I had invested myself so heavily in being. Uh, as I redefine who I am moving forward. And my first inkling was not to accept his request. But then I thought about this as a young brother trying to stand up and be a man. Uh, he seems to have had some good influences. And he's reaching out to me so he sees something in me. I have a responsibility, even in my pain, to stand up. And so I did it. Uh, and I'm glad that I did because when he finally said, hey, I've edited it and I put it up, here it is. And and I, I watched it, I said, can I share it on my channel? He said, for sure, go ahead. And the reason I'm sharing it is because a few people who, you know, I talk to, I confide in, and they're wondering how I feel now with so much of my uh, philosophy being ingrained and embedded in black love do I feel differently of course not um, this isn't about me not loving my wife and I don't think it's about my wife not loving me um, but uh, it's not something that I'm going to go into detail on on social media um, you know and I'm you know <coughs> I can't speak for what anybody else is doing but I'm not going to do that. I can say with honesty and conviction, I honored my marriage uh, and I'm good uh, in that, in knowing that I never gave up on it. I never disrespected it. And, you know, I think I'm a better man for having been in it. And I'll leave it at that. Um, where it goes from now is out of my hands. But to answer the question, what, how, do, how does it make me feel? It doesn't make me feel less committed to black love. It makes me feel more committed to black love. It makes me search myself to see in what ways I can be better as a man, to be more in tune with the things that are going on around me. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people who is going to run around saying, look what happened. You did. Uh, no. What I can't control, I can't control. What I can control is saying, look, you can still be better. And that at some point you're going to love again. And at some point you're going to be what you need to be in the best way you can be it. So my focus now is still encouraging people to love one another. And, and this goes so much further and beyond my situation too. Um, being responsible beyond yourself is where you make a legacy. Uh, getting caught up in emotion, getting caught up in stuff that is singular in nature to you and directly and specific to you limits your capacity to touch lives. And I refuse to allow that to happen. Uh, you know, I've only spoken of this once before, and that's when it first happened. And this is probably the last time. But and it's because of this video 
uh, in this interview. Uh, it was uncomfortable for me because, again, I was dealing with something. And um, this is something that we men, and I'm really hoping that, and I'm sharing this because of this too, because we often visit the pain of our women. And I think we need to be aware. Men, we need to be aware of their pain. We need to be aware of their pain in a way that we're probably not. And we need to be attentive to their pain. But often, we're not allowed to feel it. We're not allowed to have it. We have to go over and, and, and the way we respond is it, with a jagged edge. The way we respond is with aggression. The way we respond is with vitriol. The way we respond is with hatred. No, I'm going to respond with love. That's the way I'm going to respond because I can't grow in any of those natural, those negative emotions. I can't become what I need to become. I can't look inside of myself and search myself when I've hardened it. I need to open up. I need to feel. And it's okay to feel. It's okay to say I'm hurt. It's okay to say maybe I made a mistake. It's okay to say what could I have done better. But at the end of the day, what you have to do is you have to look into the future and you have to say, what can I do now? What can I do now? How can I be better now? How can I still have an impact? You know, uh, and, and, and people ask me, and I'm going to say this and then I'm done. Uh, people ask me about my last book. Uh, second to last book, Merging Souls. And they say, well, you know, how does it feel to have written you know, uh, a couple of books specifically on marriage, and most of your books has some form of black love integrated into the message. How does it feel, you know, to be where you're at right now? I've had that question asked by a couple of people who are close to me because they want to know how I'm going to deal with it. I wrote Merging Souls going through this. Um, and Every ounce of me was being challenged because I said, how can you sit up and say you have any knowledge or expertise on something? Look at you. And my thing is, no matter what happens to me, number one, I'm human. I'm a long way from perfect. I'm not infallible. I don't always have it right. I don't know everything. And I've never presented my message in a form that says, because I am the G guru on this, you've got to hear me. It's saying from what I have observed, what I have learned, what I have studied, what I have been able to uh, ascertain in my, in, 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 in my observations, this is the best route. Now, it doesn't mean that I master everything uh, that I attack because I'm in this thing and I'm learning just like everybody else. I'm in this thing and I'm learning just like everybody else. But I believe in black love. And, you know, it is what it is as far as what I cannot control. And I've got to be okay with that because I have a life to live and I have so much more of me to give to the world. And my thing is, all I want is the best for her. Um, and everything that she uh, desires and wants and sees and needs out of life, I hope she has it because she's been through a lot. Long before I came on uh, to this, she's been through a lot. And, you know, I wish her happiness because she, she's had enough, you know, not being happy, you know, but um, I have to be okay with knowing that I gave what I had and that I honored our marriage that and that I fought and that up until I was told, hey, it's not working, I never backed off. I never gave up. I never quit. And so I'm good with that. But I, I needed to put that in there because there are people out there that are going through it. And there's a very thin line between fighting to make something worth work that has value and 
tolerating something that doesn't. And we are often encouraged to stay in situations that are diminishing us out of obligation, out of old fashioned points of view and perspectives. And while I believe we have definitely diminished marriage and covenant and we don't give it the gravity that we should in the way that we approach it, that we t too easily lay it down, we cannot take such a uh, dogmatic approach to it that we're having people stay in places that make them miserable. And we have to learn how not to be offended when someone says it's not working. And we also have to be challenged when someone says it's not working. And in being challenged, what we're saying is, what could I have done differently? How could I have been better? You may not be able to fix what's broken here, but you don't need to break anything else. And you don't need to have situations where, other pe where, where you take the same problem or the same viewpoint into the next situation. You want to grow at every opportunity. I'm saying that because people out there need to hear it. And I'm also saying that because I know there are a bunch of people out here who looked at my marriage as inspiration and have expressed how heartbroken you are by it. Don't be heartbroken. Still be encouraged. Still be inspired. Um, there's a lot that came out of this to me that was so positive to me. Uh, I can't speak for my wife, uh, and I won't intend. I don't. Uh, I won't attempt to speak for my wife. But what I will tell you is that I want her to have the best, to be the best, and have the impact that I dreamed she would have in the world. Uh, because there's a story behind it all. And there's a message she has, and I hope that she continues to give that message because there's so many women out there that need to hear it. And me, I'm, I'm, I've been on the journey of healing for a while. And my thing is healing, growth, introspection, examining myself, uh, not taking a victim approach or mindset. Um, and I am going to ask that everyone respect my privacy as far as details. I have no desire to share them. Uh, the, uh, the people that I needed to confide in, I've confided in. We are praying. Uh, we're standing together. And to me, there is no me against her at all. I want the best for her. Uh, at this point, it seems that comes or she needs to pursue it uh, in my absence. I give and surrender that to her. She That's her freedom to claim. I don't possess her or own her. Um, and that's the stand on that. So again, you know, I'm not going to be giving any details or going out trying to put put out my side or uh, trying to do anything to just stand on who I am. I'm going to keep living my life and I'm going to let everything that I do from this point and the things I've done before this speak for me. And then I'm going to keep doing. Uh, and I think by the time I'm finished living this life, my life will have spoken pretty well of me. Um, but I'm about to get real quiet on that, and I'm about to get real focused on my work. And I just had to put that there because that needs to be a closure to that opening when I shared with you when this first kind of came to a head. Um, you know, and, and even then, you know, this, it, it was no attacking. Um, you know, I, I, I'm glad to have shared the time I did with her. I hope that's something positive that I left that 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 I've left there with her, and I am going to 
thank you guys for loving on us and big up in us and you know celebrating our moments of celebration and all the things we had because I remember a bunch of good things and those are the things that I'm going to hold on to and I'm going to smile every day I'm going to be thankful every day I'm going to give my honor to God and my movement and my work and my humanity again I'm not perfect but I'm learning and as I learn I teach so on that I show and appreciate, uh, show love and appreciate everything you guys do. And on that note, here's the interview. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is your host, JC, Everyday Fox. Everyone gather around, should be a good one today. Special life coach, motivational speaker, a man of God, a husband, and a brand new father. So congrats to my wife and I. Today's topic is Evaluation of Black Love. Special guest with me today, Mr. Rick Wallace. Uh, very pleased to have him join me this, this morning. So, Rick, how are you doing today? And give everybody, you know, a little background about what you're about. Uh, hello, I'm Rick Wallace. Um, I am the uh, executive director of the Odyssey Project, which is uh, directly focused in uh, addressing issues within the Black community. I'm also uh, the founder and CEO of Rick Wallace Enterprises, which uh, houses a, a number of entities, including the Visionetics Institute, where I deal with everything from helping people cope with trauma to life coaching uh, in the spe entire spectrum in between. Uh, my focus is being the best person that I can be so that I can help other people, um, but being aware of my humanity so that I can connect with people, uh, which is immensely important to me. Uh, I believe in Black love uh, as the core foundation of Black empowerment. I don't think we achieve uh, Black empowerment. Um, Sorry. Oh, no worries. And um, so my, um, my focus is a number of different things. I've been doing research uh, for the past 30 years uh, in my field of study, which is psychology and sociology but also in finance, um, in politics, and, and in so many other ways that um, we are impacted in this world. And it is my belief that the marriage is the foundational institution through which we perpetuate the mindset of Black unity, Black empowerment, financial literacy, financial responsibility. It is where we socialize our young males into being Black men who know how to deal with our women, which is a major issue. Um, I developed a Black Men Lead as a rite of passage initiative, uh, which is designed to socialize young Black males into Black manhood, which I think is a unique experience when we talk about manhood. Uh, the black male experience creates a very unique experience. And so it's important that when we say manhood, we know that we're speaking of black manhood because there are a number of nuances that makes that responsibility unique. And so I think that is first and foremost, something that we need to uh, confront. And so, yeah. I mean, that that is the basic. So everything sort of comes out of that. Yeah, most definitely. I mean, black love is everything. And I just felt like me being a newly married man, I will only be, me and my wife, we've only, uh, we've been dating for a minute. We got married almost two years ago and we have our first child together. So it's really been, you know, a blessing, you know, first black child. And I was the type of guy that, I mean, I've dated for black women, black women only. And that's kind of what I've, I've been prone to date and what I'm really excited to you know, be with, because that's what I want to be with long term. And that's the thing about Black love. Black love is something that you have to have self-love. You got to be selfless. You got to be willing to give. 
and be really willing to receive all that God has in store for you. And a lot of times as men, we don't really we really know the essence of black women. A lot of men like to degrade women, you know, talk down to them. But you gotta understand, you know, black women are clean, black women are the reason why we can do this podcast because we were birthed out of a black women. And we have to make sure that we outlive and motivate black women because black women is the heart and soul. And the thing I don't like about as far as some men is that they keep trying to put other races of women ahead of black women. Oh, you know, black women, they got too much of an attitude. They always selfish or <laughs> always stuck up, but not really understanding that other races of women have the same, if not worse, but we're constantly degrading our own people. So how can we expect to build, how we expect to have real love if we're constantly degrading our own women, a race? I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, I'm 100%. Uh, I'm probably one of the most outspoken voices against the late Kevin Samuels. Uh, again, you know, despite being in opposition to the way he moved, um, respect to him and his family, rest in peace. I don't believe in stomping on somebody's grave or trying to attack them when they're not here to defend themselves. Uh, but I will say that I was very outspoken when he was alive. Uh, and I thought he was dangerous, not so much because simply because of the vitriol and the approach, but because there were some truths into some of the things that he was trying to deliver, but because he was delivering it in a way that was demeaning, disrespectful and degrading, I think that it missed the mark. I think it had no force. It didn't help anybody, but people who had issues with black women. And that's what that, that was his followers. Those were the people who really enjoyed it. You know, you heard some women that would come along and agree with it, but as a person who literally works with people to help them be better. And part of my job is to tell them that you're not. And I've been doing it for almost 30 years now, and I've yet to do it in a demeaning and degrading way. And I have like a 99% success rate. I know there's a way to do it. So, you know, there's a way to tell a woman, you might not want to do it this way. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe it's not working because and then you take it from there and there's a way to do that. But I think before we can really start talking about as black men, before we can start talking about what it is that black women need to do, I think we must look inside of ourselves and search ourselves out and ask, what are we doing and what can we do? Are we healthy? Are we approaching it? Because number one is there's this ambiguous idea of what manhood is in the black community oh, you know yeah. you know you you got to have the bag to be a, a man you know and that's one of the things that kevin samuels pushed is that you, you you know the whole high value thing and i think that uh i believe in a high value man i just don't believe that his bank account is the only thing that brings him to that point i think that there are things that are actually more important than his bank account i do believe in a man being a provider but i also know that a man has to start somewhere and and being that we don't come from a race of people that is passing down generational wealth the truth of the matter is statistically speaking the average black man is not going to start from a position of being able to carry a family he has to develop and grow into that increase his value in a marketplace that doesn't want to accept him and that's still possible, but that's gotta be the force. And to, to have that, you gotta be whole, you gotta be healthy. And so we need to be creating strong black men. And I believe it starts with uh, working with young black boys. Well, I know it does. Well, definitely do start with the youth. Uh, that's one thing I was trying to be as far as a youth counselor, because it starts with the youth, because I feel like the youth is the one that's most impressionable, ones that are, in their 50s, 60s, they already had their trial and errors, and a lot of them are kind of stuck in their ways. So you have to start from the youth and just teach them and train them so they can grow into be productive men. And the thing about right. men is that a lot of men think about manhood is that, oh, hey, how many women have I slept with? Oh, how much, how much money do I have? No, that's not manhood. Manhood is can I protect my family? How 
how am I leading them? How am I providing for them? You know, do we have lights on? <laughs> do we have food on the table? You know what I'm saying? How are we spiritually? Are we going to God? Are we praying daily? Are we, you know, you know, having fun, good activities? Are we building lifelong generational, you know, activities? And ultimately, what is our legacy? What's my legacy gonna be? You know what I'm saying? Like when the when when it, when the day when your death day happens, what are people gonna say about it? what did you do from the time you were born to the time you dead? What'd you do between that period? That's what it matters. And you see right, guys right. like Kobe Bryant, Muhammad Ali, uh, John Lewis, like they're no longer here, but they last a long impression. And you have to be that type of man that, hey, he 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 wasn't just here. He he meant something. He made he impacted not just his life, not just other people's lives, youths, pastors, uh, churches. Uh, different kind of organization. That's the type of man you want to lead, the kind of legacy you want to fulfill at the end of the day. You don't want to be like, hey, I just existed. Hey, I just worked a nine to five. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Everybody's, you know, core value, everybody's lifestyle is different, but you want to be more impactful, more meaningful. Like, hey, I really turn nation. I really try to be a really a good source of, of a good, good source of leadership to our community, you know what I'm saying? It starts within the home first. It starts with, you know, having that relationship within your household first and letting that dwell to, to the outside world. Because I feel like the manhood, his first priority is the family, God, or whatever kind of spiritual you lead in. You know, that should be first and foremost. It's not about, oh, you know, having the, you know, the new, newest Jordans or the new designer clothes and stuff like that. I mean, that's all luxury stuff, but it's not going to be uh, you're not gonna take that to heaven with you. You know what I'm saying? So what did you right, right. what are you doing right now to make sure that 2042, 2060, 2080, that your your name is gonna continue to live on and your legacy is gonna continue to live on. That's one thing I like, I think on my my perspective that you know manhood is all about. You know what I'm saying? It's not about the right. black, the old, I got a I got I got a Roy Vince, oh <laughs> I got a Tesla, like that's cool, right. that's great for right now, but What's your legacy? Right. What kind of impact are you making on the community and your family around you? Right. Well, pe- well, people who who follow me will literally hear uh, some of the principles and tenets of my philosophy and what you just said. Um, I have two. I have two doctorates. One is in theology. The other is in psychology. And so I have that approach to understanding things. I don't consider myself to be a religious man, but I definitely consider myself to be a godly man and a man who is very given to his purpose, his God-given purpose in this world. And I often say when I'm speaking that the first half of my life was about me. It was about showing people what I could do, what I could drive, where I could live. And, and, I, and I did it. Uh, we, were, we were at the cigar shop last night. And there's a lot of guys, they know, okay, he, he owns his own business, he's successful, but I don't do a whole lot of talking about my past life. But something popped up about something that I did in the past, and they wanted to see a picture. So I pulled up some old stuff, and we got to talking. They're like, dude, yeah, this is what I used to do. And I tell people all the time, the first half of my life was about me. It was about all of that. But the second half of my life, until I take my last breath, will be about my legacy. Um, the uh, in, in the book of Proverbs, it says that a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And the automatic takeaway for most people in that is I'm leaving them money, which you are supposed to. You're supposed to leave them wealth. But I think the best thing that a man can leave his progeny, his offspring, is his legacy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because your legacy is what speaks of you after you're gone. The, your the le- legacy is why we still talk about Malcolm, why we still talk about Martin, why we're still talking about Jesus, why we're still talking about people who live. Uh, you know, I mean, whether we agree with who they were or not, they did something so impactful in the world that they left something that people are still talking. You know, Alexander the Great. We can go back and we can just look at people who decided they weren't going to be average, that they were going to take what they had and they were going to put it in the world and they was going to they were going to do something. Some of them were very misled. Hitler. But 
those of us who can focus and have a connectivity to God, that's something inside of us that guides us, the spirit of God, that pushes us in a direction that we do what we're supposed to be doing. See, everyone, I can tell you from, I've worked literally at this point in my career, I've worked with thousands of people uh, and I, that span the gauntlet. The gauntlet. I, I've worked with people who are extremely impoverished, come from extremely impoverished backgrounds, extremely wealthy, and everything in between. I've worked with people with Down syndrome, people with autism, people with other learning disabilities, ADHD, oppositionally defined disorder, depression, everything you can imagine under the sun. And I tell people all the time, I've yet to meet a person who doesn't have a gift. God gave every last one of us a gift. The gift is indicative of our purpose. The, dick, the gift is what's going to facilitate our purpose. Again, Proverbs tell us that your gift will make room for you and bring you before great men. And what it's saying is your gift will expand your reach, your gift will expand your influence, but it will also put you in the, in, in the presence of people who will open the door for you to do the things God sent you to do. So the thing with black men is how do we want to build our legacy? How do we want to be spoke of after we're gone? More importantly to me, my legacy wasn't, my legacy is okay, yeah, I want people to know I came and I did some things that I should have done. But how is my legacy supporting my offspring down the line? What are my great grandchildren and their grandchildren benefiting from my legacy? You know, when, when someone says my name and my great, 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 great grandchild, you know, is there, what does it do for them? Yes. How does it empower them? How does it say, man, I come from this? I don't care what you put in front of me. I come from this. And see, that's the beauty of being reared by my great grandfather. I was reared by my grandmother's parents. And so I had a man in front of me who literally grew up on a, a, a farm sharecropping with his dad. He was born in 1909. So his principles and focus and his idea of his masculinity was different than most people, the age of fathers, of my friend's fathers. He saw it differently and he taught me principles. And I think that there are certain principles that go into this legacy you're talking about and I'll turn it back over to you. Number one is uh, when I'm talking to men who understand God, I talk in godly terms. And I think that you, you definitely understand God. So I'm gonna talk to you in the way if I was lecturing to a group of men. The first, everybody talks about the bag. Everybody wants him to be a six figure earner. When my statistics tell me that the median earning, uh, the the uh, the, the uh, earning median for black men is forty four thousand, and that only about six percent or less of black men earn six figures, so all of ex that 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 expectation that's being pushed primarily in social media and uh, uneducated conversations yeah. is not realistic. It doesn't mean that any man that's out there can't get it it means that that's not the uh, available in truth right now. And so what are we going to do about it? Because we do, we need to build wealth. We need to be able to take care of our families. But uh, there, to me, uh, in black men, if you want to simplify black manhood, there are five Ps. And I've done it. The first P isn't, isn't provider. The first P is protector. He has to be able to protect everything that he's been given to cover. He's supposed to be covering her and the children physically, emotionally, psychologically, financially. He's supposed to be covering them. He's a covering. He's a protector. You can't get to them without going through him. That's the first thing that a man has done. And I teach young boys in Black Men Lead. I teach them that, the no, matter of fact, the number one principle, there are 11 principles of Black manhood that I teach in Black Men Lead. In that, there are the number one principle is that a black man never causes harm to a black woman psychologically mostly physically never okay so we teach them but we teach them this number one is at a certain age when you're born you and your female counterparts your sisters your cousins your female friends you, you are equal physically in every way, you know, in some instances, she might even be bigger than you in certain parts of your stage. You're growing six, seven years old. She may be faster. She may even be stronger than you at that age. But there's going to come a point in time where you leave uh, you leave that stage of childhood and you start going through what's called puberty. That's when you start to produce at a much higher level than she does. 
a hormone called testosterone. It's going to make your voice change. It's going to also uh, make you stronger and it's going to increase your ability to develop muscle. And you're going to start outgrowing her. You're going to be stronger. And it's going to give you an, somewhat of an emotional edge. You'll be more inclined to engage somebody physically because of that aggression that comes with testosterone. I said, now, let me tell you something. All of that I just explained to you, the strength, the size, the aggression is not meant for you to turn it on her. It's meant for you to protect her. That's why you become stronger because you are the physical protector. Before you're, before you're able, able to earn a dollar, you are already able to defend. So your first thing is to protect. Second, you got to be a provider. And how you define provider has to become a universal understanding because there's this erroneous idea that if you can't spend 100000 on your house a year, that you're not a man. And the truth of the matter is that you have to build together. You have to build together. You have to come together. You have to figure that thing out. Do you want to be at some stage to be able to tell your wife, if you don't want to do it, baby, you don't have to. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful thing to sit up and say, if you don't want to work, you don't have to. But you're going to find that she's got she's got something in her that makes her want to do something. So she's got to have something she's doing. But that's two. So you have a provider. I mean, a, a protector, a provider. The next thing is a promoter. And people say, what's that? Say a man in his home is always elevating, excuse me, like no, uh, is always elevating and, and edifying the people in his home, his wife. You're beautiful. You're awesome. You're going to do great. This, he's out there telling other people, she's so awesome. She's so beautiful. She's so great. She does this well. Do you need this done? My wife does it well. My, he's out, and then it's with his kids. You're awesome. You're beautiful. Something I used to do with my daughters. I have eight of them. Something I used to do with them when they were young, started with the oldest one who's 30, 30, she'll be 37 in September. So walk by them in the house. As soon as they st were able to talk and hold uh, any type of conversation, say, who's the most beautiful girl in the world? Say, I am daddy. Say, and what can you do if you put your mind to? I can do anything, the sky's the limit. And I would do that. If I pass by them in the house five or six times, it's, hey, Who's the most beautiful girl? And eventually I got caught because I got more than one daughter. And everybody's like, well, why you say, well, all of you are, let me tell you how. And I explained to them how unique they were and their uniqueness made them beautiful in that area. And nobody was more beautiful. And what I was doing is I was instilling in something in them that they would need to, to need to know until they went out into a world that told them that they weren't beautiful, that this is what beauty looks like. And it's a skinny female, skinny white female. This is beauty. You know, your curvature and the, Forget the fact that the skinny person is trying to get your body. But this is beauty. Why? Yeah. Because we are the dominant culture. So we get to define everything. Well, so before my kids went out, my boys went out understanding. You go out and you have to have a business mindset. Even if you're working for someone else, you have to have a business mindset. Because if you're working for someone else with a business mindset, you're not just working for them. You're learning the business. And you're learning how you can do the same thing and you're starting to develop confidence that they're not better than you because the natural inclination to think is if I go out and he's the one hiring me for the job, he's better than me. He's superior to me. And you start to see white people differently. I wasn't ever allowed to do that. I was like, hey, look, he's got that. I can have it, too. Well, so you promote you. In other words, you don't use your family to elevate you. You elevate your family. OK, now here's where it gets deep. Number four is he's a priest. He is a priest. And what I mean by a priest, I don't mean it in the religious sense. I mean it in the spiritual sense. While if you have a spiritual house, a godly house, your wife pray every day. I tell you that women going to pray. They going to show up and they going to pray. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer that she prays. I'm talking about the divine connection between the man in the house and the man of God. I mean, the, in God, where he's communicating to you and you communicate to him and you're asking for guidance and you're putting a covering over every person that walks out of that house so they are safe when they're not directly under your covering, that you're speaking into their lives. And that priesthood is the person who keeps the, 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 the spiritual uh, connectivity between the divine and, and what we deal with on earth lined up that's your responsibility you have to be a leader and a teacher in that area okay and then the final thing is the prophet 
And when I'm talking about profit, I'm not talking about that, you know, there's the office of profit and then there's the gift of prophecy. I'm not talking about the gift of prophecy in the sense of being able to see into the future and predict things. I'm talking about the office of profit where you speak things that God gave you over your home. Where you literally speak into the life, you will be successful. You are successful. You will be safe. You speak into the lives of your family. Those are the five P's, the five primary principles. Those are the things you build your legacy on. Those are the things that if you do that, you have a better chance. Now, you got to understand as a man too, though, that there is a consistent force that's going to be moving against you if you're operating in your godly gift because you are a threat to the world as it stands. You are a threat to the system. You are a threat to everything that is not of God. You are a threat. And so you will come under attack. That's going to be a part of it. But you've got to know that you're not the person or the thing that's letting it in. And so that is, you know, when you talk about legacy, that is so important in being a man. It is the thing that extends you in your impact for your children. Because see, one day, you, like you said, one day is going to be the last day. Yeah, but if you live the legacy, yeah, that's why if you've heard me, if you've heard me, oh, uh, I end, I, I, I end, I end almost all my videos with saying I live my life on full. Oh, oh and I want to end on E, yeah. Yeah, I'm a down, I'm a down E, down e yeah, because <laughs> I, I can't take it to the grave. That's what one of my mentors, Dr. Miles Monroe, he, he he always said that the wealthiest place in the world is a cemetery. I've heard Les Brown repeat it, but it initially started with Dr. Monroe years ago. And he said, the wealthiest place in the world is, is the cemetery because what? You take your gifts, you un, 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 unstarted businesses, unengaged opportunities, relationships not developed, books not written, companies not started, all of these things that you had in you that you didn't do because you were either afraid, paralyzed, worried about what someone was going to say, all these other things that will stop you, and you didn't get out there and do them. That won't be me. That will not be me. Uh, if all my, my, all my legacy may end up being is dude showed up yeah. every day. Well he showed up every day, even when he didn't feel like it, even when his heart was hurting, even when he said, I had five heart attacks in March of 2020. Now, since then, I've gotten myself back together. Now, the crazy thing is the first company I ever started is a fitness company. So I've been doing fitness forever. So I know what I'm supposed to be doing. But again, you get into your work. And when your work is research, you spend a lot of time doing what I'm doing right now, sitting. And so I got caught up, put on a lot of weight. I've dropped over 30 pounds since then. But I had five heart attacks. The, the reason I bring them up is the day I got released and came home, the next day I was in the office working. I am just like that. I, you, I'm not finished. There's nothing that's going to shut me down. And I've, go, I've got a lot going on right now, but it's not going to shut me down. Why? Because I will say when I'm done, that I gave it everything I had, that I gave my, my first of all, my wife, my family, my people, uh, my work, my clients. I'm not showing up halfway. I'm not going to put in 25, 50, 60, 75, 80%. I'm putting 110 every time, you know. Um, and so my thing is to a young brother like you and all the brothers that are going to watch this, there's a level of manhood that you can achieve that will speak of you after you're gone. Oh, and that's what you should be striving for. Yeah, most definitely. Like I said, I appreciate, you know, you, know, you say you had a heart attack. I appreciate you being a man for the daughters, your sons. Like I said, that's what I'm trying to do with my life, just try to be the best husband, the best father, the best son. And me and my dad, we talk about legacy all the time. We actually made a video a year ago talking about legacy. And I always try to spend time with my dad. Grandfather, he was a great role model, a great mentor to me and my dad. And I'm all about community, family, have a great relationship with my, my dad-in-law. You know, we kick it. And like I said, we're looking forward to Father's Day next weekend. So really, you know, appreciate my first Father's Day. So like I, like you said, you're opening, you know, you want to you wanna, wanna die on E. So you got to put everything between your birth date to your end date. And there's no, there's no coming back. There's no like, hey, you know, I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have said that. 
when, when they lay, when they put you down in the dirt, that's it. There's no what else, shoulda, coulda, woulda. So you have to do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait next week. You have to do what you plan on doing, whatever God has for you to do right now. But yeah, though, I have to end this call. I have to get back to my wife and child. So I appreciate you joining me. Um, so until next time, I'll talk to you later. I appreciate you for your time again. Until next time, I'm out. And once again, this is Rick Wallace. I appreciate him joining me this morning. So long. Appreciate you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Have a good one.